welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy came and home. here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Every the one, the only, Mr. Jerry Springer. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you to those in the upper deck. <laughs> we got a lot to do tonight, and yes. uh, we have uh, Tyler Childers coming on later. He's really yeah. good. <laughs> to play some music. Uh, Jerry, I wanted to ask you something. I know uh, that in the last number of months, there have been a number of people who have come to you, communicated with you, and they run from past office holders. This is in the state of Ohio. Where, by the way, you live for many years, and you were in town here once a week to do this podcast, so you still have a, a kind of a rather regular presence here. You've been city council member, a mayor, a news anchor, and all of that. So you speak all over the state for the Democratic Party, even around the country. You've been a great advocate for the Democratic Party, raised money, donated money, et cetera. So that's kind of your background in this. So I guess because of all that in your obvious leadership capabilities that we, those of us who know you, know you have, you have been asked by a number of people, like I say, some past office holders, some current office holders, some party officials, some county people from the Democratic Party, labor people, grassroots, but some people have come to you and said, please consider running for governor in the state of Ohio. And I know that you have sort of systematically processed this because I've sort of from afar watched you do this. And I want to ask you, are you ready to talk about it? And if so, please do. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thanks next up. Tyler, a come on down. <laughs> John, you want to write down that quote? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it, it, for the last six, eight months, actually last spring is when it first started. And, uh, you know, you get a call out of nowhere, and then all of a sudden there are a bunch of calls and then emails, and then they want to have a meeting and stuff like that. And at first, of course, it's obviously very flattering and exciting. And I've been active in Ohio politics for 48 years. And in fact, on Thursday, it'll be 40 years to the day that I was sworn in as mayor of Cincinnati. So I, I just tell you that so that this is really I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. tell you, th this is hard for Jerry because this is a, yeah, I'm fine. I'll be fine. It's it's a real passion for me. Um, yeah, political issues, my love of Ohio, how, what it's meant in my life, and uh, so I take this stuff really, really seriously. So I thought about it a lot, and we did research, and we did, you know, polling, focus groups, all that kind of stuff, and. Um, it became harder and harder because, to be blunt, it really looked like I could win. So it wasn't just, oh, this will be exciting to run. It's like all of a sudden, for really the first time in my life, it was like the perfect storm. That um, it was an open seat um, in, in Ohio. It was a state that's been a major part of my life. And uh, I love politics so much, and I love the issues so much that this was, you know, at my age now, the golden time to, oh my gosh, I could be governor of the state of Ohio. And that was and is an exciting concept. And I understood, but every once in a while you gotta step outside yourself and say, even though this is something wow, you know, as you grow older and hopefully get a level of maturity, you're able to kind of step outside yourself and see you as the world sees you and what, what the world is like. And I knew that the initial attraction was the fact, uh, particularly in this era of celebrity, is that one, I'm well known, two, I have financial wherewithal, and three, I have a political identity in Ohio. So could, I could understand how professional politicians and political people, people that are interested in it, and they know my basically liberal politics, that, oh my gosh, here for once is someone who could win, and you know, we, we could have a really competitive race in the state of Ohio for a Democrat to be governor because Kasich can't run again. 
So I understood why they were coming to me. And then you got to figure out, once you figure out that it's all possible, then comes the decision of, well, do you do it? But I'm not 30 years old. I'm not 50 years old. And I have responsibilities that are my life. Politics is something I love, but in order to be governor of the state of Ohio, it's a five-year commitment, the year of campaigning and four years in office. And you don't even think about becoming governor of Ohio unless you're willing to devote every minute of your life for those five years to serving the people of your constituency, which in this case would be Ohio. This is not a job you call in. It's not a job that you can put on your resume. You're running one of the largest states in America. You're running a little country in a sense. And now with what's going on in Washington, there's even more responsibility. And so I have to say that it, the day I would be taking office, I'd be a month short of my 75th birthday, am I prepared to make a five-year commitment at this age when I have enormous responsibilities in terms of my family, which I don't have to go into the details, but and do I want to? What kind of a person would I be to walk away from that? Because, ooh, I could be governor. And so I can't responsibly say That, um, that I can do it, so I can't. And uh, look, it's purely personal in terms of my feelings about this. Believe me, no one is gonna you know, spend a second saying, oh gee, you can't run. So I realize it's just my personal passion for the office, but it's not something as a, uh, as a husband and a father and a grandfather that I can do at this point, to just walk away and say, you know, I'll see you, I'll, you know, you know where the mansion is, and you know, give me a call. Um, and so there's that, which is we the whole family got together over Thanksgiving, and you know, it became clear in my mind, this is not anything that I would put the family through. Every single one of them said, "You got to do." You know, they love me, so they say, "You got to do what you want to do." Mm -hmm. Well, no, I got to do what I know. Deep in their hearts, they want and what would make their life better, and, and stuff like that. There's also another part, where as I step outside myself and look inward, is I did the Labor Day parade in Cleveland, uh, and, you know, two months ago. And the crowd, it, it then hit me really very clear for the first time. The crowd response was, frankly, unbelievable. I mean, literally, they came onto the street where we're going. They didn't stay on the sidewalks, and it was just nonstop for two hours of people coming, wanting selfies, et cetera. And it dawned on me, they would not be doing this if I was selling insurance. In other words, my celebrity is based in large part on the television show. In other words, when people say, hey, Jerry, man, love you, man, it's they enjoy the show for whatever, or the, whatever my personality is as they perceive it. And we've just been through that. Mm -hmm. And even though in my heart, and I hope you would agree that I'm not at all like Trump, I don't want to add to the circus. And it gets lost in, you know, I become a distraction. The first question every candidate other candidate running, immediately they're going to be asking, well, what do you think about Springer in the race? And, you know, and, 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 all, and that is going to dominate, is going to dominate what the news coverage is for the election. And I know that because I'm in the media, I've been in the media forever. So I know what the hot subject will be. And so to win an election just because I have a television show, or to have that be talked about the whole time and not what is really important to people in Ohio, like being able to get health care when it looks like the federal government is trying to take it away from them, you know, and where are these jobs going to get and what about our schools and all the 
serious issues that we got to deal with. I don't know that I really helped the cause. And the other people running, they're, they easily are as good as I am. You know, I'd like to think that I could bring something to the table, but it's not like if one of them is governor, you know, people are going to suffer. You know, I have better jokes than they have. <laughs> so you put all this together, and, you know, what makes it sad is because of my age, I realize this is it. Now, it's only it in terms of ever being a governor of the state or a senator of the state or whatever. Uh, but in terms of my political activity, that's not going to stop. I'm still very interested in unions. I'm very interested in working class people. I'm very interested in poverty. And so those, those issues are not, you know, I'm going to be just as active as I've always been. It just won't be as a candidate. So I, I was flattered by the initial interest. And certainly, as it looked like, as I said, we had a real possibility of winning. You know, that's all I thought about going to sleep at, well, second thing I thought about going to sleep at night. Mickey, <clears throat> hello. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> She's a lucky lady. <laughs> she was wondering why I'd wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Holy Toledo! <laughs> 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 but, uh, <laughs> this is why I can't I, be This governor. is exactly <laughs> why I can't be governor. <laughs> Oh, man, I wouldn't have to tweet. So, uh, <laughs> So anyway, and I, I've spoken long enough about it, but uh, it, it's not something I can do now. And so I will wind up working for other candidates and working for the same causes and coming up. It's just for the same reason we do this podcast, to be honest, mm -hmm. for two and a half years now. We're here every either Tuesday or Wednesday night doing this. Um, obviously, it's not a money maker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it's just, it's a way for me to spout politically and uh, plus be with best friends, et cetera. So anyway, that's the decision. So that's the long one. And there are some causes uh, that are out there that you might pick up on. Uh, one is the labor. You have a great passion for labor. And I know that you've had some conversations with some people that could lead to something where you get involved in uh, solidifying and even growing the labor movement yeah. in America and as now we go back to your celebrity power and by the way before you were a TV star because we've been friends along with our wives since like 1970 and I've seen you especially in the context of Cincinnati before you ever became a TV star where people in parades would go nuts when you would roll by in a car I was usually driving the car so I was the witness <laughs> so you have a connectability mm -hmm that is natural yep. and so many of us are sorry in a way I respect your decision and I understand it because and by the way you added a year to your age and I always do that as a joke and you just no, by did the it. time I'd be sworn in oh by the time you'd be sworn in you'd be yeah, okay it'd be January right it'd all right because so. uh, I always like to add when I say Jerry's age two or three years because we're the same age so I always <laughs> make sure I'm behind him and but uh, <laughs> So th there, there could be something that would involve the labor movement. You have to have some more conversations, and that's a possibility. Also, uh, we're meeting with some people who are longstanding and in in big stars in the folk industry mm -hmm. of trying to take up-and-coming folk singers who are writing songs with messages and systematically almost institutionally connecting them with causes, specific causes. So there are some progressive things and some other things that we're working on yeah. that's podcast related, in fact, uh, to try to keep Jerry's voice very much heard in the progressive movement. If it can't be this, and it can't be for reasons that I certainly respect, it's going to be something else. There's not, Jerry obviously doesn't drop off. You couldn't get Jerry out of the arena. You can't, <laughs> thank God. Um, at any rate, now I want to ask you a question about uh, North Korea in a second, but we did get a couple of emails. I am running for president of North Korea. <laughs> well, <laughs> by God, they could use yeah. you there. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take five years. You shoot off a missile, if your job's done. <laughs> but something on just a little lighter note before we go back to something that's actually very serious. We get, get emails all the time, and there are so many. And I just, you know, we call it rip and read, just grab mm -hmm. some. And one came in, and this is from uh, 
Tom Enda from Denver, Colorado. Happy holidays to all of you. He's talking, I think, to the three of us. You make my week with your humor. Uh, Jerry, your crisp political analysis and the music. I always love the music. Then uh, I got this one. Something's going on here, David. Uh, some popping out of the speaker. Then we got this. Uh, Dear mm -hmm. Mr. Jerry Springer Esquire. This is to you, Jerry, directly. <laughs> Esquire. Last Saturday afternoon, I saw Mr. Gene Galvin, this one's about me, I guess, in, a, in the grocery store parking lot. Oh my. I know it was be him, Tried to him because I watch your podcast <laughs> on Facebook Live. He was driving a 1980-something Plymouth <laughs> Reliant. <laughs> I believe that was the K car, and it's not what I expected. Clearly, he is not being paid what a man of his preparation deserves. <laughs> Jerry, it's right. <laughs> Jerry, you have lucked up in this world, and it would not be too much to ask for you to either compensate Mr. Galvin with a fair, more Democratic Party kind of salary, or as an alternative, this is interesting. This is very could, interesting. <laughs> couldn't you reach into one of your deep pockets, maybe along with one of your rich friends, and buy Mr. Galvin a new car? <laughs> That's an Is interesting that from idea. You or from Bonnie? Yeah. Isn't that Jerry? <laughs> Wasn't that done? <laughs> oh, what? It was. That was the Reliant. Uh, it's, to, to you, that would be a small thing, likely to Mr. Galvin. That would be a dream that's over the moon. I'll leave it to you to do the right thing. That's from Katherine Hopkins from Ellesmere, Kentucky. Is that spelled G E N E Galvin? <laughs> yeah, is that how yes, that it is was. spelled? Yeah. Okay. That was a nice email. And I it just thought, right. I, <laughs> and thought I would. Wasn't one of the yeah. options that you give you a nice Democratic salary? <laughs> yeah, just yeah. about <laughs> what you get. Is a Democratic salary. Yeah. Yeah. Not a Republican one. Not, not a Republican, Republican but a Democrat. Jeez. Hey, um, so now the North Koreans oh. appear to be able mm. to shoot a missile from there, according to media reports, yeah. to the to Washington D.C. Yeah, uh, and and today, by the way, uh, the leader of uh, North Korea called Donald Trump, said that he did that to send what that crazy old man a message or something to that effect. So he's sort of. He doesn't tweet it. He does it. Instead of tweeting, yeah. he shoots a missile up into the ozone. Yeah. So they don't have cell phones in North Korea. No, so. but they got <laughs> a missile. So yeah. what's your take on all that? Well, you're right. The missile, the um, ICBM was um, shot off, and it went three and a half miles in the air and landed a, um, not that far away, you know, near Japan. Uh, but by going three and a half miles up in the air, it had the power, because if you're at a war, you don't send it three and a half miles up in the air, you send it you know, horizontal to the earth. Yep. And uh, as a result, they said this missile could go uh, 8,100 miles, 8,100 miles. And uh, New York and Washington, which would be furthest away, uh, only 6,100 miles away. So clearly, they have the capability now of hitting any city in the United States. Now, the, the missile they sent off did not have a nuclear um, miss a bomb on it, uh, but so that still has to be developed whether or not it could carry uh, a nuclear weapon. Uh, but they're going so fast with their development that we now have to assume that they can send missiles with nuclear weapons against the United States. Now, North Korea had paused in their testing for about 60 days, and there were behind-the-scenes kind of talks, because everyone, not everyone, but there were people that were thinking that he would set off a nuclear test while Trump was over there in Southeast Asia to embarrass him. But um, they determined that he's beyond embarrassment, so they didn't do it. No. Uh, <laughs> But, but they didn't do it, uh, thinking that this would be an opportunity by them showing some uh, good faith, by not sending off a missile, that maybe now there could be some kind of a negotiation. But Trump refused to negotiate, and uh, as a result, the 60 days are over, and sure enough, the missile goes up. Now, here are the problems, and some of these problems you've heard about, some maybe not. Okay, we start off with Kim Jong-un, um, the North Korean leader, 
Uh, he's a tyrant, and he's also crazy. But he's not necessarily irrational. And the fact that he's not irrational is why there is nothing we can do to stop him from creating, developing these nuclear weapons. And the reason for it is the North Korean people and the regime, which was his father and his grandfather, these people, based on reporters going over there for the last 20, 30 years, the people of North Korea absolutely believe that the United States, at an appropriate moment, will attack them. This is not just bluster. The people <coughs> honestly live in fear. They think America, as, because remember, we don't have, a, we don't have a, a peace treaty with North Korea after the Korean War. We just have a truce. So there's no treaty yet. And they believe at some point we are going to bomb, attack, take over North Korea. And they believe that the only thing stopping us from taking over is the fact that they have nuclear weapons. This is their core belief. So there is nothing you can offer them to give it up because Kim Jong-un knows that once he agrees to stop development of the nuclear weapons, he'll be overthrown. That's his whole life. He, the regime will fall, he believes, if he doesn't have nuclear weapons because nothing will stop us from taking over. And they believe that their whole lives. So we have to start off by thinking, well, if we have a different strategy, maybe he'll give it up. No, he'll never give it up. So that's the first, so that's why he plays the nuclear card. Now, what exacerbates the problem that is over here in the United States, we have a crazy guy with his finger on the button as well. And his constant belligerence Trump saying there'll be fury and fire confirms Kim's fears. He believes, as a rational person would believe, if I think you're going to blow up my house and then you go around saying it'll be fire and fury in your house, well, duh, it just confirms what I always thought. So what Trump is doing is making a bad situation even worse and accelerating their need to get nuclear weapons because they believe we're going to attack at any moment. And Trump keeps threatening. You don't know what I'm going to do. There will be a response. I'll handle this. You'll see. A few weeks ago, he said, there's some big news coming. We have a surprise. So he's just exacerbating this situation. Now, Trump says no to negotiations. So it's not even as if, well, North Korea could negotiate something to make their lives better and maybe therefore less hostile, because Trump says to Rex Tillerson publicly, don't waste your time negotiating, negotiations are off. Secondly, they are dismantling the State Department, so we don't even have ambassadors in that area to deal with whatever negotiation or whatever diplomacy we want. And then what Trump has already shown the world is that no treaty is sacrosanct if you do it with America. Trump has shown the world that making a treaty with America is not worth the paper it's printed on because a president can come and reject it at any moment, whether it's the Paris Accords, NAFTA, whatever it is. Our word is now dirt. That is the damage that Donald Trump has done to America that can't be rectified in a few years. It'll take a generation for people to once again believe that when America makes a deal, it keeps its word. He has destroyed the word of America. So where does the negotiation from that go? Also, it's not just that the world knows that Trump is crazy. 
And where do we, it's not just saying it on a podcast here. You've read the, seen the memos and the reports that have been printed in other countries. When Trump goes to visit, they actually have in the memos, the foreign leaders, how they should deal with Trump. Give him a big parade when he arrives. Flatter him. Laugh at his jokes. Say he's a wonderful person. And when they go over there, that's exactly what they do. They're working him. They're playing him. And these memos are in print. We've seen the leaders being briefed. When Trump comes, this is how you behave. All you got to do is say he's a wonderful person and he'll be your friend. And then they get whatever deal they want. That's why he comes back and he always says, oh, he's... Uh, this leader I met with, great guy, we really bonded, you know, he, he really respects me. Putin thinks I'm wonderful, you know. <laughs> and it's not just world leaders that think Trump is a crazy man. In our own Republican United States Senate, last week, a Republican committee held hearings on whether Donald Trump is fit for office in terms of his finger on the nuclear button. The testimony and the hearing was about whether there are any safeguards to stop Trump from getting up in the middle of the night and first putting his finger on the tweet and then put his finger on the button for a first strike nuclear attack. Because right now, there's nothing that can stop that. Trump has the black bag. Trump has the code. There is nothing in our law which stops Trump from just getting pissed off, I didn't like what that leader said about me, and launching nuclear weapons. We don't have any safety catch. So Congress is even the Republican committee is now considering what legislation can be in place that if he's going to launch a first strike when he gives the code, whatever the people are at the missile sites sending off the missiles or in the Polaris submarines or in the planes launching the missiles, that they won't do it unless something else happens. And what they're discussing is the possibility of a special committee, maybe made up of some cabinet members, maybe made up of some generals, but putting in place some protection that Trump on his own cannot start a nuclear war. Now, if we're attacked, obviously you can't have a committee meeting as to whether or not you know, any president has the right to respond if we're being attacked. But to start a nuclear war, we need some legislation to prevent a president from launching an attack. And that is what is going on now. My hope is maybe there's enough publicity about it, and maybe they're having these conversations, responsible people in the government, that some general, somebody that gets the order from Trump to launch a nuclear attack would not do it, even if it means that's a crime. Because wouldn't you rather, for your country and to save the world blowing up, face a trial. I mean, who's going to convict this person who said, I couldn't push the button, I know I got the order, but I didn't want to blow up the world. That guy's not going to jail. But anyway, if th your choice was blow up the world or go to jail for a bit, I would hope that any decent person would decide um, to go to jail. So hopefully we've got some people with real integrity at the highest levels of our government that won't be political, recognize he's a looney tune, and not set off a first strike nuclear attack. That hopefully is, is what we can do. We keep talking about, well, China can get North Korea to, you know, to not have nuclear weapons. China's not going to do anything that's not in its interest. And it worries that if it cuts off the oil to North Korea, they'll have a refugee problem. Government will collapse, the society will collapse in North Korea. Millions of people from North Korea will go over the border into China just for survival. And then North China has this problem. 
and uh, plus the United States would then move into Southeast Asia, um, you know, taking over, and the last thing China wants is the United States established in Southeast Asia. So that's not, the, that's not gonna be the solution. Here's the one thing that's worth trying. We could have negotiations, try to have negotiations, not to have North Korea do away with their weapons, because as I said, they're not going to. But how about negotiations to start having a positive relationship so that they won't want to blow us away? If you start having trade, if you start having relationships, we had 50 years of a Cold War where the Soviet Union could blow up the world 20 times over, not like North Korea with a few missiles over here, but literally blow up the planet. And we were able, with a policy of containment, to keep world peace in terms of nuclear war. We should try that policy of containment now. And that's why you have negotiations to establish better relations. Stop trying to think that you're going to get North Korea to give up their weapons. Because if you go in there to try to get them away, you've got a war. And within 48 hours, millions of people will die. The distance between North and South Korea, major cities, Seoul, South Korea, is less than the distance from Dayton to Cincinnati. Everyone would be obliterated. It's crazy. Final thing, remember the movie Wag the Dog? Mm -hmm. What I started thinking about these last few days, there's more and more information coming about of what's about to happen to Trump and the people around him with the Russian investigation. If things get too close to him and he is already a loose cannon, Wag the Dog was about starting, a, it was a the idea that you would start, a president would start a war to get attention away from a scandal, that one being Clinton and Monica. Uh, that's what that movie referred to. But this would be Trump worried about being indicted, worried about impeachment, get the country's attention off that, let's start a war someplace. So he'll start a battle with North Korea. That is a very real worry. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. And so I am announcing today my candidacy. But honestly, Jerry, that's the kind of, you know, like what you just talked about, how you took us through all of that. That's why people want you to run. You know, that's why people would love that. And as sad as, as sad as we are that you aren't, we're happy that, you know, we've got people coming to the stage right now that are helping to continue this folk music. And we, and we are going to continue to do topics that are going to be right where they need to be for you, yep. sir. So Thank we you. can't wait to Thank hear you. more from you. Yeah. And in the meantime, we're going to talk to our friend Tyler Childress. Is that, did I say it right? Tyler Childress. You Childress. Call me anything. Okay, Just got don't it. call me late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Tyler. We're excited yeah. to have you and all so of your friends. Yeah. I'm going to steal buddies. that line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I stole it somewhere down the line. <laughs> well, introduce yourselves to us, please. Well, my name is Tyler Childress, and uh, over here on my far left uh, is Jesse Wells on the uh, fiddle, the bare tone. Over here on my closer left is uh, James Bloodbath McGrath Barker. <laughs> See, that's a cool steel. name for you, Jerry. <laughs> Back here on the drums with the funky beats and the Colgate smile is uh, Mr. Rodney Elkins. <laughs> <laughs> Over here on my right, um, all the way from Milton, West Virginia, where they called him the Milton Minstrel. Spent a little time in Miami, Florida, where they called him the Miami Kid, making a name for himself wherever he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Craig Berletic. Well, excellent. So first song you're going to be singing for us tonight is the Honky Tonk Flame, yeah? I'm sorry? Honky Tonk Flame. Is that the first song? Yes, ma'am. All right. We'll take it away, gentlemen. We're excited. <laughs> Just moved to the country to get me some rest. The 
city put a hurting on you Especially a fella from eastern Kentucky Without a penny or word his name Wasting his life on a burning desire And chasing that honky-tonk flame Soft on the eyes and a him on the hearing, leaving me helpless lines. To get you to listen the way I was feeling, the plans that I'd made for our night. Hold on now, buddy, won't you wait up a minute? You're mistaken if you think I'm the same as them skirts you've been chasing all over town. Along with that honky tonk flame, I'm a woman with love so true. Truth of the matter, I give it to you. You just got to slow down and quit acting that way. Burning your barn in this honky tonk flame. It ain't touch for the taking The minute I learned how to breathe Finally found out that the love of a woman Who loved me was all that I need Still on the road cause I ain't good for nothing Except writing the songs that I sing Beating them strings like they're owing me money And chasing that heart Tonk flame, but I got me a woman with love so true. Darling to me, but that's a missus to you. All I did was slow down, quit acting insane. Burning my barn in this honky tonk flame. that can't you uh, yeah hop on up there yeah, you, you, <laughs> so you, where can we hear more of that man that is incredible <laughs> well i just had an album come out uh in august and that was the one produced by sturgill simpson, simpson you know. and uh <laughs> Dave ferguson that's you know kind of cool. fantastic <laughs> you know, you'd think you'd be able to afford a better jacket but no <laughs> kid <laughs> <laughs> Why do why do I do that? Same reason seven hundred ninety seven. This is certainly not a politic and jacket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it depends on whose side you're on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say actually it goes real good in North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> that album was called Purgatory. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> 
That really was great. No, that it was, was fantastic. Oh, and they're going to play another one for us here. But if you would like to hear some more of their music, you can go to Tyler Childers music.com that's t-y-l-e-r-c-h-i-l-d-e-r-s music.com and um let's hear we're excited for your next song white house road yeah Run these roads. 
is pretty cool stuff. <laughs> again, ladies and gentlemen, that is Tyler Child Childers. I'm not going to get your name wrong again. I'm sorry. Please go and check them out. And if you don't mind, gentlemen, Jerry Springer is going to hop on in here for uh, Down by the Riverside. So that should be fun. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> But thanks so much for being with us tonight. And again, go check these guys out. You can always go to Springer.com, JerrySpringer.com, and listen to them there, too. And for people sitting in the audience, because if people hearing this later, well, people are going to hear this, actually, uh, later tonight, this episode. But they're at a place in the greater Cincinnati area yeah, right. called Southgate House mm -hmm. Revival yeah. tomorrow night. Correct? Oh, yeah. Tyler, you're playing tomorrow night? That is correct. We are playing with uh, Blank Range and uh, Cincinnati Zone. Arlo McKinley. Woo! Okay. Oh. Who's been on our show and, a few and times. Tyler because really is on a, a fast track They're sold for out, stardom in the Americana country music <laughs> uh, genre. Very, very cool. Well, we uh, are very excited to have you in. What key are we doing this in? <laughs> hey, he wouldn't know the difference. This is the good Lord's key of A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sing in L sharp. <laughs> Because